We welcome everyone to this December 11th meeting of the Corsican ISD Board of Trustees. This is a regular meeting and all items that will be discussed have been duly posted. While this is a meeting in public, it is not a meeting of the public. If you wish to speak, please register in the lobby on the audience for guest forms and follow the information on the speaker form. The board's role is to set goals, approve personnel and budgets, make policy and provide oversight. We are not here to manage or solve individual problems. Management is the responsibility of the superintendent. As a board, we believe that we must educate every child, provide every child the greatest opportunity to learn, and maintain a safe and secure environment, both mentally, physically, emotionally, and academically. These are our core values, and we appreciate your interest in the students of CISD. All right. We're going to be led in the Pledge of Allegiance by the Navarro Elementary Dream Squad, by Xander Woodall, Mia Pinedo, Isabella Madeira, and Emma Eliason. Follow your lead. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state under God. One and indivisible. Thank you very much. Thank you. We appreciate it. And if you'll pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to be here today. Bless this school and bless this school board that we may do what's best in your sight. Please provide us the wisdom to lead these children into the future. And Lord, please do every, everything that we do, be it a blessing in your sight. This we ask in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. First thing is we're going to get move into the public hearing. For the first report. We're going to ask Mr. Former. Hello. Thank you all for letting me speak with you tonight. Um, you should have received uh, the TEA's first report rating, as well as all the disclosures um, in your packet tonight. Just want to go over that quickly with you. Um, this year we received a 94 out of 100. Uh, that is a two-point increase from last year of a 92, so, we're, so we are improving. Um, one area we continue to work on is area 11. I want to point that out to you. That is the uh, ratio of long-term debt to total assets. Um, we received a two-point increase in that. Uh, the main reason for that is because we were able to pay down $4.5 million for our total long-term debt uh, from 21-22 to 22-23. Um, and also maintain our total assets at about the same rate. So if we were able to continue that, um, we, we reduced that, or our ratio increased by about 3%. If we were able to continue that uh, path, we could see us improve another two points um, in about three, or two to three years. So, um, so that, would, that would bring us up to even a better score there. Um, other than that, everything stayed relatively consistent. Um, nothing, nothing surprised us across the board. Um, and you know we continue to, to monitor this, and um, our auditors are working right now on the numbers that will be in this report for next year. So we'll, we'll hopefully report that to y'all in January, and um, then we will see um, if we can get this number up any higher going forward. Um, if y'all have any questions, I'll be willing to do my best to answer them or go from there. 
I do want to be very clear that we have an A. Our rating is at A, and even though we, you know, want to be perfect, we want to have 100, but we're very, very pleased and happy to have an A. We do a great job with our um, financial integrity in the district, and so that re that's reflection of that. Is there any questions for Mr. Farmer? No. Okay. I think we're good with that. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. <clears throat> Is there any public comments about our first report reading? Okay. No comments. Okay. Corsican ISDs. Let's, uh, let's, now let's move into the adjournment of the first report reading. Right. Just yeah. adjourn it. Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. Superintendent report. Okay, we have a busy two weeks ahead of us. Um, as we move into the holiday break, there's several things happening and we want to make sure that our public is invited and that they have seen these things that are going on. First is our band winter concerts tomorrow night at the high school. If you come at six, you can enjoy dinner and support the band boosters and then the holiday show starts at seven. On Friday and Saturday night, the Penguin Project is presenting The Little Mermaid, the world-renowned Penguin Project at Corsicana High School. Both performances are at seven. Tickets are available um, if you'd like VIP seating the tickets are $15 general seating is 10 and if you are a student you can do a coloring sheet and get in for free staff gets in with their ID badges so we encourage and invite everybody to come see our wonderful um, penguins perform the Little Mermaid our GT fall showcase is currently taking place first through fifth grades are on display at the drain learning center and fifth and sixth are at Collins each grade has a different day and you can check our website for the schedules Ongoing, um, we had our first movie night at the Palace um, yesterday afternoon. I guess it was movie afternoon. Um, we had um, a couple, about 200 uh, families come and see the Polar Express. It was really fun. Santa was there. We had our conductor at the door, um, making sure everybody could get on board. Tonight, with, um, we're seeing we're doing Elf, and tomorrow night is It's a Wonderful Life, and then it's the Grinch. So we encourage our staff and their families to come and enjoy a wonderful holiday show. I have special, some special recognitions tonight. One of our juniors, Aneja Horton, was recently selected to perform at Carnegie Hall in New York. She has an incredible voice. If you haven't heard her sing, um, she's absolutely amazing. Our district choir groups performed a, con a Corsicana Christmas on the same day as the parade, which was last Saturday, and once again delivered a wonderful and um, festive and holiday inspiring performances um, to kick off the holiday season. Our CHS cross-examination debate team of Maite Garcia, Hugo Hernandez went undefeated at the Waco Connolly meet and they were also awarded top speakers. Luke Wallace was third and Liam Otto was sixth in current events and overall we won the team championship. Our um, FFA students in the radio broadcasting team of Jackson Brown, Eli Thompson, and Molly Gomez finished six overall. And our Ag Issues team of Elaine Myers, Sarah Beck, Jake McSpadden, Braden Herman, and Audrey Leibel was in the top 24. Over the weekend, our boys' basketball t um, program did something that was unique for us. We had a 32-team tournament. We had varsity, JV, and ninth grade teams, and we even had one team come and participate from Melbourne, Australia, which was pretty pretty cool to have a team here from Australia. We want to congratulate all of these students, teams, and our organizations. Three more recognition recognitions that I have go out to the entire school district, from students to staff. We had a restock the wraparound pantry drive. We um, asked for non-perishable items to fill the wraparound services pantry, and this is a service that provides benefits, food, clothing, and the basic uh, needs to our families. It was a huge success. Um, the middle school alone collected more than 2,000 items. I think it's because I personally challenged them. 
Um, and as a district, we had uh, we were just uh, just shy of 10,000 items, oh, wow. which is wonderful. So thanks to everyone for that. Um, second, I want to say thank you to the employees of Atmos Energy. They worked tirelessly last week, and we had a natural gas outage. It impacted the schools. Um, I want to thank our food services department, and Ms. Howell, and our principals and our teachers. Um, we really didn't slow down. Um, the gas was out, but we were able to feed our students breakfast and lunch. And I appreciate so much the Atmos employees and the way that they worked with us. They communicated incredibly well with the district. I couldn't have asked for more. And um, then they came to our homes and made sure that our guests, guests was turned back on safely. So thank you to Atmos. Finally, I want to thank our school board members. Um, through your vision and your stewardship, we were able to provide our staff with retention bonuses last week. That was really exciting. Everyone was absolutely thrilled about that. And I just appreciate your vision and your foresight in being able to make things like this happen. Final reminder, at the, after the holiday break, the staff comes back to school on the 8th and our students come back on the 9th of January. So happy holidays to our um, district and our community. Make sure you repeat that because you <laughs> students come back on the 9th and we have a special surprise for high school and middle school students on the 9th so they need to all be sure and be here it's going to be great all right thank you dr frost all right now we're at the common scholarship update Thank you, Dr. Frost and trustees. You all look festive, and I think we have some good information, some good news for you all, so hopefully we can keep that holiday spirit flowing. Uh, one thing I will note, when you look at your report, it will look a little different than the last few times we visited with you. We have some more advanced reporting that we can do, but it's set up on a quarterly basis, and so we felt like it was better to go with this to give you more accurate, up-to-date information. And so. We'll dive into it. Casey's going to go over the returns, and then I'll talk to you about where you're at from an income standpoint and kind of where we see the next few months going. And as Jared said, the good news is that there really isn't too much to talk about because everything has been uh, pretty positive, which is nice. So if y'all will flip to this first page, uh, this gives us a good account summary uh, for the overall fund. You can see that your cash equivalence portion makes up just over $1,050,000, which is 5.67% of your total market value. Your equity and fixed income positions are split pretty equally with equity at just over 9.3 million, uh, which is 50.25% of your market value. And then fixed income and mutual funds, uh, that's just over 8.1 million, uh, which is a little bit more than 4.4 or 44% of your total market value. So adding all of that up, you can see your grand total uh, as of November 30th, 2023, is $18,568,078.91. If you all will flip to the second page, I want to point out some changes that we've seen in your account composition uh, for the year to date. So this is going from 1231 of 2022 to 1130 of 2023. There really hasn't been too much of a change, but you can see that we have a slight uh, uptick in total cash and equivalents, uh, which now again makes up a little bit more than a million dollars. Right now that's earning 5.24%, which is obviously still great. Uh, it's above you know, most fixed income short-term rates right now. So uh, still providing really great income for the portfolio. <clears throat> a big portion of why you see that increase is because of your cash contributions, which can be seen lower on that page. That's money that's coming from that mineral interest income and being contributed back into the fund. So you can see you had 254000 over the last 11 months that have been contributed back into the fund, and that's really why you see that increase in cash equivalents. Uh, you can also see your distributions there, about $470,000 over the last 11 months uh, for a net change of negative $270,000, which was uh, more than compensated for by your total account re return, uh, just over $1.56 million. Uh, that means your total account return was 9.02% uh, 
uh, for the last 11 months versus the composite index return of just 8.39%. And then moving downwards onto page three, I'm going to talk uh, about the uh, trailing returns a little bit more on page five, uh, but one area where I do want to point out is your performance in large cap, and that's because I'm going to highlight it here in a second. Uh, you can see that your portfolio's return is primarily driven by large cap, which again makes up more than 50% of your overall per portfolio. Your return was 16.31% over the last 11 months versus the S&P, which was 20.8%. Um, so one of the questions that we have to ask there is what's going on with the S&P and why is it doing so well, especially considering our current economic position. Another area I want to point out is our fixed taxable securities. That's one of the main reasons why we are able to outperform that composite index return. You can see your portfolio returned 4.03% uh, versus the Barclays U.S. Aggregate Bond Fund, which was negative 0.77%. So that's a really huge moat for fixed income. Now flipping to page four, I'll talk a little bit about um, how we outperform in fixed income. And you can see that again in your account composition. You can see that going back now to November 30th of 2018, so five years ago, uh, versus today, your cash portion made up 10.63% of your overall portfolio. And you can also see that your fixed taxable securities made up just 33.69% of your portfolio. And that's because we were in a low interest rate environment, so there really weren't very good coupons that we could go out and purchase. Um, so instead, what ended up happening was obviously as the Fed continues to hike interest rates, you're seeing that cash is being moved out and it's getting invested at a pretty decent coupon. And that's really a testament as to our fixed income investing strategy. So, you know, buying those uh, high, high paying coupons, but also sticking with the low paying coupons, because this is a perpetual fund, we're allowed to hold those to maturity. So we don't have to take any losses. And you can see that your fixed income portfolio uh, performance really shines here because of that. Uh, moving downwards, you can also see uh, towards the middle of the page, your five-year return was an annualized 6.31% versus the composite index return of 5.16%. And then moving on to page five, you can see some trailing return information on a fiscal year-to-date one, th one, three, and five-year uh, trailing return period. Uh, <clears throat> The first thing that I want to point out is how your performance, uh, you can really see the impact of, Fed's, of the Fed's rate hikes uh, from the five-year period where your return is 1.75% uh, to now the one-year period where your return is 4.92%. Um, so really some positive movement there. And then in large cap, what I wanted to talk about again, you can see that your five-year performance was 13.44% versus the index or the S&P, which was 12.5%. And you can see that now in a, on our one-year period, that's trailing downwards. So you can see your return was 11.41% versus the S&P 500 at 13.84%. So really we need to think about what's going on with the S&P 500. And there's been a, a pretty interesting uh, series of events that we're seeing. Um, based Basically, we're, what investors are calling it is the Magnificent Seven, and it's a group of the uh, mega cap stocks, tech stocks. So these are all growth stocks that are really driving the market forward. Um, over the last 11 months, each of these seven stocks has returned anywhere between 47% to 220%. Um, so obviously, the game is how many of those seven stocks can you pick? In this case, we have five of the seven. So you're going to slightly underperform because we didn't pick seven of the seven. Uh, <clears throat> but you can definitely understand how having those seven mega cap stocks would skew your portfolio's performance in comparison to the S&P 500 when you consider that it makes up more than 27% of the entire S&P 500 in just those seven companies. Another area I wanted to point out was how the Fed's interest rate hikes uh, seem to have affected mid-cap and small-cap performance, um, which is pretty pretty standard. That is, you know, traditional that uh, mid-cap and small-cap is going to get hit harder by hiked interest rates. Um, certainly, 
more so than large caps. So that would be a better indicator of the overall market performance versus the large cap performance, uh, which is inflated again by those seven stocks. And then moving downwards, you have fixed taxable securities. You can see that the moat looks really good over each of these periods, outperforming 164 basis points on the five-year period, 322 basis points on the three-year period, and 549 basis points on the one-year period. So really taking advantage of those increasing interest rates. And now Jared is going to talk to you about the income position. As Casey mentioned, you, you, the Collins Fund has a lot of cash. Uh, if you go back to early last year, we had a big buildup in cash. Well, interest rates were zero, and so we bought a Treasury and a government bond that will mature. Two hundred thousand will mature as a Treasury next month, and then another hundred in February. So you're going to have about one point three five million in readily available cash for your scholarships. Uh, as you go throughout the spring and, and get into your selection process for the next school year. And so uh, one thing that Casey mentioned that we've been able to take advantage of the last year plus is pairing back some of the risk from owning stocks and buying some uh, fixed income that's earning quite a bit more than what we've been able to do in the last 15 years. And so even though the value of the fund hasn't fully recovered from where it was at January of 22, you're earning substantially more income for the uh, scholarships. And so uh, oil and gas has been pretty stable. Um, it's certainly not where it was last year. As you can imagine, with oil prices kind of hovering in that 70 to, to $80 a barrel range. And I think that will likely continue uh, as we go through the winter. And so you're really in good position. Uh, spin, spin, spin. So, <laughs> is there any questions? No, no, <laughs> no. I had I tried to take her her uh, in retention bonus, but she <laughs> she didn't. You know, she gets to, gets a hold of mine, but I don't get to get to get a hold of hers. So. Yeah. You know, and so I also wonder if we can come to a compromise and, and keep some of that back too, just in case a 2008 hits the end of 2008. Right. And so I think that's one of the unique positions that the scholarship is in is right now we're in a mindset of spending the income. Uh, and during low interest rate environments, you could almost flip it where you can rely, rely on the market growth to fund your scholarships. But when you look at you have $1.3 million in in cash, that's not accounting for all of the money that you'll earn as we go throughout the year. You're talking about over 500, probably 550 thousand dollars just in dividend and interest income. Then and then oil and gas. Yeah, just on dividend and interest. And if you'll go back, you know, five years ago, it was almost half of that. And so that's really grown, and that's been the interest rate environment. I said, uh, I think when we did this last, it was 750000 uh, and I, I still feel confident about that because that's oil and gas. That's in addition to, the that's in addition to what you already have accumulated. So. so, Jared, there's nothing to say that we could reinvest some of this one point three. Correct. Hold on for a yes. Day. So. So what I would do with that now is with. You know, Casey mentioned money markets earning around five and a quarter. That's paying monthly. Uh, that's that's good. Uh, I think you keep doing that. There may come a time here in the next few months. I think the Fed is right at the the ending of their hot cycle. So I could see a scenario where rates cuts start to come forward, probably towards the latter half of next year. Then we can have that conversation of maybe going back to buying. Uh, CDs and of a short duration, but you guys are really in good shape. What about uh, buying some um, good, strong dividend paying stocks? 
We, we certainly could. You could always transfer some of that money over. Um, I think right now with where the market is, I'm, I'm certainly much more bullish on bonds right now than stocks, just, uh, just being honest. And so I think there may come that time. You know, we've done that in the past where, you know, there's just not a lot of good options as far as the, you know, bond market goes. And so then we're taking that 50% stock portfolio and driving it up to 60%. And so I think you've got a lot of flexibility. But we be we be fine with, uh, on that 750 number. Right. Yeah. 750 will have to spend pretty much every year. I think. I wish. We had a two, yeah, we had a 250 year. Yeah. Which is just hard when you have a 750 year and then two years later you have a 250 and the kids don't get that. Right. Or yeah, if you. I, that's why I'm. Me, I always want to say, let's stick at that, you know, five, yeah. six, seven range where you can. So I know one of the goals that you all had was to draw down some of that money that's accumulated. And I think this past year, um, you, know, you all were certainly more aggressive with, with your scholarships. And I, and I still think that's a good thing. Um, honestly, I was looking at it earlier. You're still, even this year, af after that increase, earning more in income than you are spending. And so. That number keeps will keep continue to grow. Yeah, I mean when you when you look at uh, there's not many school districts in this country that have anything remotely close to this, and so to be able to award uh, close to a million dollars in in scholarships and you know basically send kids full rides to any any college in the state that's a or public college in the state, that's a pretty good thing. We, uh, the, the day we were, you, you find this interesting, the day we were at TASB and, and one, the next day we had like almost like a press conference, you know, where we would sit up there and they would ask us, and I, one of us just mentioned the comm scholarship. The questions were like, come on, y'all have what? I mean, they could not believe, you know, the comm scholarship. That was one of the big questions. We had somebody from a uh, smaller town, I can't remember which town it was, ask how to set up a scholarship like that. And I said, well, find you a very wealthy man that's got a lot of oil and gas property. <laughs> so, I mean, it, going back to when Mr. Collins set this up, it was nothing compared. I don't even think he could have envisioned this. I mean, you're going back to the 50s and 60s and, you know, the income level there and seeing where it's at. There's no way you could have predicted this. Right. Any other Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Texas Workforce Housing Foundation presentation. Um, we have um, two representatives here, Mr. Hall and Mr. Harden. Correct. Um, I haven't met Mr. Harden, so I'm just assuming that you're the other person on the PowerPoint name. So thank you both for being here. We're very, very interested in hearing about this tonight. No, thank you. Uh, we appreciate you giving us some time tonight. Uh, I'm John Hall. This is Adam Harden. Um, again, we, we thank you for being here. We know what a great school district Corsicana is. Uh, I think we're both a little fearful that we're following up uh, an endowment or for, for scholarships that's given away nearly a million dollars a year, which is fantastic. I'm not saying this is going to be on par, but I do think it's pretty exciting given uh, how other districts are using this to help teachers provide affordable housing. Uh, but let me introduce us a little bit further just so you get to know us. Um, we're attorneys, so don't hold that against us. Uh, but we consider ourselves good attorneys because we, we, we only do public finance work. And generally, we're working with school districts. We serve as bond counsel to a lot of districts. We serve as underwriters counsel on a, to a lot of other transactions that school districts are involved. Adam's a tax lawyer who also does a lot of affordable housing. Um, so kind of the spirit of our law firm is to do things that really have a positive impact on the general public here in the state of Texas. Uh, so we, we don't go to courts. We don't have any billboards or anything really salacious to talk about in that respect, but uh, we do try to put together really good ideas for uh, school districts to take advantage of it and hopefully uh, make their district a better place. Um, Adam grew up in Sunnyvale. I grew up in Plano. We may both live in San Antonio, but we still spend a lot of time up here in North Texas. Uh, I've got a, had a bunch of friends that went through Corsicana schools. 
Um, so again, we, we know it very well. And I was delighted when uh, Dr. Frost pulled me aside and said, hey, I overheard you talking about this program. Do you think it would work for Corsicana? And I was like, we'll certainly try to see if it fits. And the more she talked about it and kind of the circumstances and the, the environment that is here in Corsicana, it seemed to make a lot, lot more sense. So before I go any further, I promise I mean, we could talk about this till 730, mm -hmm. but we won't, right? I know no one wants that. Um, so if you have questions while we're going through this, please stop us and ask, because I think that's very important that if you have something that pops into your mind, you want to know the answer, that you get the response and, and, and get, it, get it resolved right there. All right, let me see if I can do this. Oh, there we go. All right. Ooh, I went too. Oh, this may be the older one. Oh, let's start here. Uh, so what is the Texas uh, Workforce Foundation? So if you recall, uh, if you drive down to around Austin, especially SH-130, you've got the big Tesla plant, right? And that's a big economic engine on the east side of, of Austin, east, of Travis, east side of Travis County. And that was created by, or authorized under a municipal management district, okay? That's what created Tesla, kind of all the economic incubators for that area. The MMD created a public facilities corporation, which we refer to as the foundation, that was designed to provide affordable housing for folks in that area. And that was to hope to attract um, teachers, being one, nurses, first responders, kind of that core infrastructure that you need when you're developing an area that's, that's the size of, of that area out there east of Austin. Since we do a lot of work with school districts, in particular, we're, we're Cobon Council at Austin ISD. Austin ISD, Round Rock ISD, and Pflugerville ISD have all made affordable housing a very important tenant in how they uh, try to support their employees, teachers, paraprofessionals. Um, and so for the last couple of years, they've been trying to address those issues. Uh, we now have interlocal agreements with all three, helping them with, with that issue of affordable housing. But effectively, the PFC that helps create the opportunity is born out of that. So I, I want to give you that background so you know kind of where these entities are, uh, where, why they were started, and what the purpose is for. Because clearly throughout Texas, PFCs, de depending on how closely you, you follow them, can have, can have a negative connotation depending upon where you may be located. This is. I would say just the opposite. It wasn't created by developers. It was created, again, for the purpose of, of providing affordable housing for essential workers. Um, and so what we figured out by talking to Austin ISD, Round Rock ISD, Pflugerville, and now you see some of the other ones we have uh, had interlocal agreements with, Hayes, Fredericksburg, Seguin, the list has grown, is that there was a, there's not just a need in the Austin area. There's a need, obviously, in North Texas, down in San Antonio, down I-35, here in Corsicana, in the Houston area. So we're, we're trying to figure out how best to deliver affordable housing to, to a district, to the employees. And the basic tenet is the district has its school district boundaries, clearly. The Public Facility Corporation is allowed to do housing. The two entities enter into an interlocal agreement, which allows the PFC to do housing projects, and they can do housing projects within the boundaries of the school district. The school district at all times is in control as far as, here's the projects we want you to focus on, here's whether it's purchasing an asset or building an asset, the control always stays with the district. It just now brings in the power or the ability for the PSC to do these housing housing projects, um, I think I, I think that's got a very clear dis distinction from the very beginning. Is that the district is in control by signing or entering into an interlocal agreement doesn't give anybody uh, an open checkbook, carte blanche to go do anything they want. Um, there's a couple ways that we can go about providing housing. Um, generally, the the form is in a multifamily housing unit. Class A. So these are places uh, or uh, apartments or apartment homes that the district would be, I think, proud for anybody 
to live in, including themselves. We, when we, when we were working with Hayes, they made it very clear that uh, to choose our words wisely, don't call it a project. So we call it a housing opportunity because clearly it is, it is so far from what you think of government housing, certainly doesn't resemble anything of the such, and we've got some pictures to show you some of the properties that are, that are involved. Um, the other kind of basic structure to what, for, for what we're talking about today is think of a, we use the, the model of a 300 unit multifamily facility, apartment building, where half the rents, or half the rooms are for market rate, half are for affordable housing. The half would, it would include obviously Corsicana ISD, teachers, paraprofessionals, whoever you decide to design the program for. That kind of leads me to the other element of this, is this is not a one size fits all program. All these school districts that are, that are up there, the ones and the others we've mentioned, every district has unique needs and wants, and the program is tailored specifically for what they want to achieve. Meaning, do we want to try to put as many em employees in these properties and acquire as many to, to solve as many needs? Or do we want to use it for recruiting STEM teachers, Spanish, SPED, those kind of opportunities? It, it can be a variety of ways. Um, so I, I throw that out there. Again, going back to the control, you guys decide um, how you want the program to look. Probably the, the best thing is there's no money that come, there, there's no pledge of debt that comes from the district. There's no pledge of M&O funds, there's no pledge of INS funds. If there's any bonding, it's done by the PFC. Um, and again, there's no credit risk to the district. There's no, there's no mechanism for the district to ever have to pay any funds into the project. Um, so that's kind of the basic tenet of the framework. I'm gonna flip it to Adam, so he's gonna give you the sizzle and kind of give you why the teachers are really gonna enjoy it or the paraprofessionals and the benefits of it. And again, at any time, if you've got questions, please, please, please ask them. All right, you ready? Yeah, let's go. Do you have any questions so far? I just want to uh, clarity. Is it the state is funding the housing project or? So really, the 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 way that the drink is stirred is through the the property tax exemption. So if this is operated by the foundation, mm -hmm. and it is operated in accordance to regulatory requirements for, like John mentioned, half of the units are workforce and the other half are market rate, it does qualify for a property tax exemption. And because it's, you've heard of a, a P3, a public-private partnership. This is a public-public partnership, so there's not a for-profit developer who's trying to take a lot of cash off the table. So it's two governmental entities trying to figure out how to kind of reinvest the tax savings back into providing deeper affordability. But that is a, it's a great point because without the tax exemption, the program doesn't work. So that's, that's sort of where you generate the savings that, al that allow it to provide the deeper discounts. Um, so here's here's kind of the sizzle. I don't know if it's that exciting, but uh, this is this is the the foundation's offer to the school district. So in exchange for being invited into the school district's boundaries to try to find opportunities that meet your needs, uh, the foundation will provide an addition an initial upfront contribution of two hundred fifty thousand dollars into an affordability fund that is accessed by the school district staff. So. If we have, like John mentioned, a 300 unit apartment complex and you say we want to use 25 of those units for teachers or 50 or 100, however, whatever that number is, then we figure out of the, basically exactly what we talked about before, of that corpus, how much can we spend each year without running out of funds? Because we always want to make sure that if a teacher comes to us or an educator comes to us, we have money to pay for them uh, for that subsidy. There's also an ongoing annual contribution, uh, like I mentioned, to make sure that it never runs out of at least $50,000. And John mentioned before, if there is a bond that's issued, a tax-exempt bond, um, those numbers would double. And so there'd be a $500,000 upfront contribution and $100,000 a year ongoing. Uh, the final bullet point is really kind of the, the tailor fit. So 
with the funds that are in the affordability fund, what can you do with them? Um, sort of a choose your own adventure. Uh, so far, everybody that we've partnered with has reinvested it back into that project for rent subsidies. But theoretically, you could provide security deposits, you could do a down payment assistance program for, you know, what we think of this as kind of a year zero to five or zero to seven program for educators and paraprofessionals who are moving out of uh, an apartment and into a home, how do you support them? And could be by providing them a down payment uh, assistance for that first purchase. Um, we've also, as we have more conversations, we hear the feedback of what about pet deposits? We're, yeah, sure, you know, it's, it, it's sort of a, however you see fit to you utilize those funds are essentially yours that are deployed for the benefit of the uh, employees. I will highlight, because the money does not go directly to the school district and then to the teacher or the educator or employer or employee, uh, it's not included in their taxable income. So a $250 a month subsidy would be $3,000 a year it's really like a $4,000 pre-tax uh, gift, if you will. Um, so that's, that's one nice feature that, that they've thought they about. They are taxed on it? They are not taxed oh, on so it. They're not interested, not interested. That's right. So if, it, if the funds flowed to the district and then to the teacher, they would be taxed on it. But the foundation pays it directly to the leasing office. And so it's not a taxable event. Um, additional benefits, uh, the, the district would get priority access to units before they become available. So we'll know, let's say, three people are moving out in January, so this is December. We'll look at if there's a waiting list or uh, some sort of interest list. We'd say, hey, here, there's a two bedroom that's coming up at this location. Do you want to come take a look and put an application in? If so, please respond within these, you know, this time period. If no one responds, then it just goes to the general workforce. but it would be kind of a, a unique first look uh, at that uh, available unit. And I think the, the final one is really, um, it kind of crystallizes what the offer is uh, or what the, the partnership is. The foundation will own, operate, finance, maintain, repair, and rehabilitate the workforce housing multifamily projects or housing opportunities um, with no financial assistance or any other obligations, financial or otherwise, from the district to the foundation or the multifamily developments. So this is, the idea is for it to be a turnkey solution to a problem that uh, we recognize exists um, without you needing to staff up, you know, real estate development or a landlord arm of the district. You can focus on your core mission and the foundation can focus on theirs. Um, we can talk about the, the essential function tax exempt bonds, but this is really the financing mechanism that they would utilize so that they can basically go to uh, bondholders and sell bonds to bondholders and be able to acquire or construct a, a multifamily uh, property. And like I mentioned before, it is a purely governmental ownership, so it's that kind of public to public uh, partnership. Um, this is an example of benefits that are delivered in Round Rock ISD. So one important thing that we uh, maybe failed to mention what is workforce housing? Uh, so we typically think of it as a, a person or a family that makes less than 80% of the area median income. Uh, the foundation tries to get 30% AMI units in there, 60% AMI units, and 80% in addition to the market rate. So you can kind of do the math, but a 30% AMI family is probably a, a cafeteria worker, janitor, bus driver, and they want to try to be able to support those people as well as the, as the teachers, the higher income earners. Um, but if you look at the, the benefits, the deeper discounts go to the people who are making less money. That just makes sense. Um, but we do have a case, uh, or actually several cases in Round Rock where uh, custodians and uh, 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 cafeteria workers are saving over $1,000 a month in rent. And those are people, families that are making less than $30,000 a year, and they're saving over $1,000 a month of non-taxable benefits. So it's, it's not always like that, but those, that does highlight the extreme that could be possible. And like John mentioned, these aren't, you know, quote unquote projects. These are uh, nice opportunities that you would be proud to call your home and you wouldn't be trying to twist somebody's arm to get them to move in there. It would, hopefully you'd find something where 
let's say we you tell us we want we want to look at this this one that we already know about we go talk to them and we find out that there's already 10 district employees living there because they just like that and we can then turn on the subsidy on day one and try to you know provide benefits to them overnight but yeah the rest of them are just pretty pictures so so in the event we don't That's a possibility, yes. Okay. And that's yeah. yeah. There's really th three ways to go about it. One is you can acquire an existing property, okay. um, and it's great if there's a. The ideal situation is you've got a Class A property in your district that someone would want to sell. Um, that doesn't always happen. Certainly, the further you get out from the urban areas, yeah. less and less, right? Um, but that's the ideal because. If you can acquire it, then you can get the units online pretty quickly. That's, that's the shortest time frame. The second shortest time frame probably is acquiring an existing facility that's not Class A, that's B or C, and the developer putting money in it to make it A. Um, I mean, that is discussed more often than you think, um, because not every, like, let's just take the Metroplex. Um, for the most part, I'll use HEB ISD, which is another district we're talking to for this. Great district, but it has a much different multifamily housing footprint than, say, Frisco ISD for clear reasons. One was built a long time ago. One's a little bit more fresh. It's just, both, both communities have developed in different ways. The third is to develop a greenfield project, which is to build from scratch. Clearly, that's the longest. But it may, it's becoming kind of the idea that's the one that the, the districts are embracing because, you know, we talked about the tax exemption. That's if, when people ask, what's the, what's the negative? What, why would someone not want to do this? Well, if you're going to acquire a project that's already on the tax rolls, when you do this, you're taking it off the tax rolls. So if you're not a Chapter 49 district, you're going to lose a little bit of AV and a little bit of tax money on both MNO and INS. If you're Chapter 49, you're still going to lose at INS, but you're already paid money to recapture. You're not going to lose much sleep for that. So there can sometimes be heartburn, but I will tell you, most districts like A Leaf ISD in Houston, they're not Chapter 49, uh, but they look at it as for the couple hundred thousand dollars that I may lose in AV or in, in actual direct tax revenue, and you're gonna give me, a, you're gonna provide me 100 units to put employees in, I can't take that $200,000 and turn it into 100 units. But that's a policy, you know, that's a, that's a decision for the district or any political subdivision. The real sweet spot is, is if the district has land that is not either being utilized or maybe is efficient or it can be used to create workforce housing and it fits within where a development would work because it's already off the tax rolls. The district then becomes a lessor lessee to the project, which brings in revenue that is, goes straight to the general fund. So think of, I mean, it, it's not a spot on a, uh, example, but like the star in Frisco, that's based on an old PID, political investment, or no, old TERS, which school districts can no longer do. But that TERS was, was around even before they built that. Frisco ISD gets like $15 million a year off the, the increases in the property values that have gone for the last 25 years. I mean, they've got a structure that no one can replicate because you can't, you, a school district can't enter into a TERS anymore. I'm not saying we'll ever generate $15 million worth of revenues and rents back to the district, but when you do have that relationship, that at least is positive cash flow coming back. And you can use that to further bolster the affordability fund, or again, you could put it right back into the, to the general fund, m and side to take care and plug some holes that maybe have some, some challenges. Um, so it's just what composition works best for your community. Let me make sure I heard this right. Yes, sir. You're saying if the district has land, but we're not sure. Correct. And we decide to 
decide that we wanted to build a bill on our land, the money would then come to us from the other rental properties. The, the, the rent of the land to the developer the to, 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 to build, yeah. yes. It seems like this could also be a real benefit to the city. I mean, when you said firefighter, firefighters mm -hmm. and stuff, I mean, my first thought was that is something that to me, of course, you know, if not now, we'll be looking for in the future to have a 22-year-old kid, you know, that's a firefighter and not making a whole lot at first. This would be ideal to me for a city. Great, and we agree. Um, and example, Jamie Wilson in Denton, we brought this idea to him. That's the route he's going, is trying to see if there is um, consensus with the county and the city. I will, yeah, because there's commonality. Now, if you're asking me, that's, that's a great gesture by Dr. Wilson, but Denton's big, right? And there's, that issue is probably already solved, but great if everybody's on the same page. That concept probably works better here because you're right, city and county both have the same issues that you guys have in many respects. It's just how well does everybody cooperate? Like if you go to Hayes, they want nothing to do with the city of Kyle. They want nothing to do with Hayes County. Round Rock ISD wants nothing to do with Williamson County. So this is where it's a community by community um, issue and you guys know best as to what would what would work well i mean you hope that in most communities that the city and the school district at the very least are pulling in the same direction but clearly here where you're located i mean you got a beautiful county courthouse one of my favorite ones to drive by in the state but you guys are all here so it makes some sense that you probably could could get all three entities mm -hmm. on, on the same page yeah no, you, so you could, you could approve it yourself and then just invite them in yep. for benefits. Yeah. I mean, think about it. Us being a Title I school, we used to loan forgiveness for how many years they worked there. So, I mean, what a recruitment opportunity that could be for us to pull in a or a coach and say, hey, you know, we need to get the forgiveness, but we can also give you a affordable housing. I know, I know you're now from I know you're now from the metro clubs, but you can get there quick and you can live here and make yeah. more money and forget your debt. You know, we struggle with housing. Yeah, and we're struggling with housing as a problem. I mean, that's we yeah. don't. I, I it, mean, to me, I think we only have one nice multi, newer multifamily. Well, that's the fact pattern that Dr. Frost shared with me that made me think this could work here, mm -hmm. because before when she first said it, I was like, I'm just curious what the economic environment is. Can we really deliver enough benefit to where it entices the developer to come in and, and yeah. build something out like that? But when she said, really, there's not much delta between a class A or rents here as compared to getting into the into North Texas, I was like, okay, that's, that's dislocation, right? That, that, that shouldn't happen because I know you guys, I mean, you guys pay well, but I'm sure you're not as, you don't have to be as competitive generally as some of the North Texas districts as they're kind of fighting each other up there. Um, and you would hope that when people come, would work here that part of it is you have a lower cost of living. Trust me, living in San Antonio, we're thrilled we're 30 or 40% cheaper than Austin, Dallas, or, or Houston. I mean, it's, it, it, every community has that, judging that is what it costs to live there. So. So you bet. Thank you. Okay, I do have a question. Mm -hmm. a couple questions back. So how long are we in this agreement for? So the the minimum would be as long as it takes to pay off the bonds, which is usually about 35 to 40 years. Um, we typically don't put a, a termination date on that because we don't really want to convert convert workforce housing back into market rate housing and displace people. Um, but I think you could, and this is me kind of maybe not coaching you guys, but it, it, you already brought this up. So you could put in a milestone that says at the end of the, you know, once the bonds are repaid, we'll do another market analysis, figure out if, we, if the community still needs workforce housing or if it's no longer an issue in 40 years, maybe some, you know, maybe it's been solved. And so then it could, then it would convert back or you could reapprove it for another 40 years or 
you know, whatever that iteration looks like. Yeah, yeah, I just, I had to say it, but that's, we'll just make that somebody else's problem. Yeah. 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 Well, if I am, don't find me, please. Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, the the statute requires at least fifty percent be reserved for workforce. So it will. I'm saying, what if we can't provide that anymore? Well, that's going to happen in the city. Is what there's something. Yeah, and it, you, I think you could probably. It, it's not a incumbent upon you to fill all those right. units. Yeah, I would. Don't look at yeah. this as the bargain is you're send you're forcefully sending district employees to live there. It's just yeah. the opportunity. Yeah. It's just the way the structure is, half of it is going to go to yeah. someone that that makes less than the, the median income, right? Yeah. And whether it's filled up by um, teachers, fire truck, or f firefighters, police, nurses, yeah, exactly. it will just cascade down to folks in that category. Mm -hmm. The benefit of doing this is we make sure that district employees get the first, get a first right of refusal, yeah. right? They are given the priority access. Yeah. I wanted you to say that. Actually. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you all. Appreciate it. Yes, and if you come free us next Christmas, we'll wear a sweater. <laughs> Everyday. Yeah, no, <laughs> I love it. I love it. So thank you. Thank you, Beth. Thank you. Very interesting. All right. Now we're going to move to the campus infrastructure presentation. Um, while Stephanie is um, pulling up the PowerPoint, I have a little bit of background information. Uh, we've been working. Thank you, both. Uh, we've been working really hard to um, get with our staff members and to um, understand and see in person what the needs of our campuses are. Our board members have spent many, many hours in the last couple of weeks on our campuses. And um, we started, just as a little history, we started with um, the survey, which you heard me mention at the last board meeting. We ended up with 342 responses, and that's a really good number because it represents over 38% of our staff. And so if you're a statistician or you took your stats classes in college, if you do a survey and you get over 12%, You've done a good job. So having over over a third of our staff respond was a really good, really good spot. So a major need on every campus, excluding the middle school, are restrooms, both for students and staff. There's not enough of them, and the ones we have need to be renovated and updated. Elementary schools talked a lot about their playgrounds. Um, they need to be refurbished. Um, some of the equipment there um, is um, really dated, and we and they, the teachers are concerned about their students on the playground. They like to see separation for the different age groups, so that we have a playground area for the little ones and a playground area for the bigger kids. And then, of course, the surfaces of um, all of those need to be updated, and they need to be uh, changed so that they are, um, especially at Navarro, where we have. Um, our special needs students so the students in wheelchairs will have the access that they need on their playgrounds. Um, campuses, now that they've seen the large group instruction area at the middle school, um, that's something that they really value. They would like to um, have those to combine instructional groups as well as for staff development and for meeting places for, for the groups of teachers. The teachers talked a lot about the labs on the campuses, how they needed to be updated and refurbished. And then heat and air conditioning is, of course, an issue on every campus except the middle school. And soon, um, by the end of this year, the high school which um, they start during the Christmas break um, with performance services. They've already, um, actually they might have started during Thanksgiving, is that right? Thanksgiving. They've already gotten their um, equipment and um, some of the supplies um, in the area, so they started with that. So we should be in good shape at the high school come the end of this year. 
Um, we then moved into lunch and learns, and a lot of the information I just mentioned came from the lunch and learn meetings. So um, we provided lunch for the staff members and then just had a conversation with them about the individual needs on their campuses, um, walked around, saw some things um, on the campuses that really were in um, dire need of updating and renovation. And now we've started the staff meetings. We finished Navarro, Bowie, Fannin, and the morning group at the high school. High school has two staff meetings, one in the morning, one in the afternoon, uh, because of their schedule. We had to cancel, or we chose to cancel the afternoon one because of the gas being turned back on. We wanted to give the staff a chance to be home when they came to turn on their gas, so we've got to reschedule that one. And then this week we'll do the middle school, Carol and Sam Houston, and next Monday is Collins. And so we've customized the presentation that you're about to see and this is the high school's presentation but we've customized this for every campus because it goes through some campus data well I'll flip through as we go through this um, we do, we do the survey results and we highlight the percent of staff and the number of responses on the survey from each campus and that way they have that perspective on now that she's talking about this, um, where did she get this information? And how many of us um, responded and what did we say? So here's just some statistics on the high school built in 1970 with two additions, 2000 and 2006. And like I mentioned, this is customized for each campus. So the high school is 337,950 square feet has 92 classrooms. The maintenance cost since 2019 has been one point eight um, five nine four three nine nine million dollars. So we've spent close to two million dollars at the high school on maintenance since 2019. By the end of this year, and that does not include anything with the performance services and the new air conditioning. So by the end of this year, we'll probably hit two million dollars on the high school. Um, the 2014 bond, if you recall, we um, intentionally did not do as much at the high school because we knew we were going to need another bond to do a big renovation there. But in the 2014 bond, we did do the secure entry vestibule, the security cameras. We did replace some AC units, um, repaired part of the roof, and then put in the walkway and made it more secure. So currently our enrollment at the high school is 1,775 students. And the capacity is 1,725 students. So we're already over capacity at our high school. Um, one of the things that we talked about a lot in um, the last bond was extending the, um, those hallways and adding more rooms and then connecting those so that it's, it's more secure. So that's some of the things that we went over as statistically at the high school. Um, so according to the survey at the high school, the priorities were restrooms, the water, and I saw um, an old picture from when the high school was um, built. I think Raymond has it in his office, and it has the um, pipes laid out that are going to be um, the water for the high school, and I now understand why they're eroding and caving in is because of what they were made out of when the school was built. What is that called, Raymond? I forgot the name of it. It's just clay? Okay. Well, that's what I was going to say. It looks like terracotta, but so it's clay. <clears throat> and the high school staff also talked about having a common area for the staff. So some of their priorities from the lunch and learn meetings were, of course, restrooms, the renovations, and particularly paying attention and extending um, that one that's by the auditorium um, and the cafeteria. It's not even close to being sufficient for um, the number of people in the auditorium for our performances, and it's in very bad condition in general. Um, the HVAC, which is in progress, they talked a lot about the fencing surrounding the school and how that needs to be updated and um, modified so that this, this campus is more secure. Um, they talked about the plumbing throughout the building. The CTE is in need of additions. Um, that's very clear. We have a very robust and successful CTE programs, and so um, we need to make sure that our facilities support all the things that our kids can do and that want to do and that will want to do in the future. Um, the cafeteria, um, if you're short space for your students and your enrollment, then obviously your cafeteria was built for um, too few students. 
um, compared to what we have now. And then the utilization and the updates of the original gym. It's just, it was built in 1970. Um, the labs, um, science, not just science, but technology, robotics, and those kind of um, courses are very different now than when that school was designed. The school was designed for education in 1970, and it served its purpose very, very well. And it was um, well designed, but education has changed a lot since 1970. Uh, we talked about renovating the library. Um, we've done a little renovation because it was in such bad shape, but um, that renovation is something that um, should be more significant than what we've been able to do so far. Um, furniture throughout the campus, um, the students and teachers have seen the furniture um, at the middle school and how well it facilitates the type of instruction that we do now. Sitting in straight rows and and being lectured is not the way that we educate kids anymore. And our furniture needs to facilitate and reflect the way that um, that our kids learn and the way that we teach. And then, of course, a large group instruction area for the high school would be um, wonderful. So this next one is um, a video about funding public schools. So. It's about two minutes, but it's pretty interesting and it's very um, easy to understand. There's not a lot of talk about how the Texas public school funding system wants to be fixed, but what's wrong with the current system? Let's take a look. The system supports more than 5.3 million students, 8,700 campuses, and 1,200 school districts and charters. It's complex, but understanding the basics and why it isn't working is relatively simple. The think of funding schools in Texas as filling up a glass. The size of the glass represents the amount of money the system uses to educate all of our students. Texas gives the state legislature the responsibility to decide how big the glass is and how it gets filled. Funding education is a shared commitment between local property taxpayers and the state. Texas school funding system was created in 1993. State and local contributions were roughly even. This shared responsibility felt right and fair. As property values in Texas began rising after the 2008 financial crisis, however, the state share started to decline. In 2019, the state share is projected to be only 38%, and it will continue to decline to historic lows without significant change. This decline has saved the state billions of dollars over time, savings that could have been invested back into our public schools. So how does this affect Texas taxpayers? It means the state is relying more on local taxes to fund public schools. It also means when your property increases in value and your taxes rise, your public schools don't see additional benefit. Wait, that doesn't seem right, does it? Shouldn't money intended for schools stay in our schools? If the state saves billions from increased local property taxes, shouldn't that savings go to improve and expand student programs and pay our teachers more? Instead, that savings is going to other things in the state budget, while spending on Texas students remains flat, despite higher expectations and rising costs. That also doesn't seem right, does it? So what's the solution? Money intended for our schools should stay in our schools. The state should invest more in our programs, teachers, and students. Their future, our state's future, is worth every penny. saving billions of dollars because we saw those billions of dollars which were available to go to public schools in this last legislative session and they chose not to do it. Um, so we'll see if the governor calls him back into session and I'm not going to get into that right now because we have to get home tonight. But um, those billions of dollars they were saving, we saw. We saw those billions this year and they had the opportunity to um, support public schools and do the right thing and they elected not to. So, I talk a little bit um, at the presentations then about school funding and the difference in the maintenance and operations budget and the interest in sinking um, budget. So, it's important that we understand that with M&O, 86% of its salaries. And so, it sounds like a lot of money, but when you pull the salaries out and um, remember that we pay for 100% of insurance, 
part of the TRS. Um, all of that comes out of the maintenance and operations budget. And in addition to that, it's all the other things, and it's not an exhaustive list, but all the other things that are listed there. Um, our utilities are expensive. Our fuel costs for running our buses um, are expensive. Substitute teachers, all the um, repairs of our automobiles, all of our technology, that's expensive. Then you look at the INS side of the budget, that's coming, that's our bond payments. And most people don't understand that if we have extra money in the INS side, we cannot use it for anything except for what we advertised in our bond election that we were going to spend that for. So the example that I'm giving, let's say that in our INS budget, um, we say we're going to spend um, $4.6 million renovating our elementary schools. And we get finished with that project and we have an extra 500000 Why can't we just take that 500000 and fix the air conditioning units at the high school? Because we didn't say we were going to do that. Unless you say that you're going to spend that money in that way, you can't transfer it later. Why can't we just take that 500000 and put it into salaries? Because you can't spend INS money on the MNO side. And so that's one of those um, examples that um, I like to give. And people don't understand that what you say you're going to spend your money for when people vote is exactly what you have to spend it for, and you cannot change that around. So why do you need a bond? Um, first, of, first of all, you use a bond when it's a lot of money. And the analogy is, if you're going to get a loan for something, it's like if your family's going to buy a car. You get a loan to buy a car. You can pay for it in three to five years. A bond is when you're going to buy a house. So that's a 30-year mortgage that you get on your house. That's the difference in getting a loan for something and needing to pass a bond. And so that's the next point that I try to make. Um, you have to spend a bond on exactly what you say you're going to. It's for long-term debt, and it's for big amounts of money. And it is the only mechanism that we have to do big things, like building schools, like significant renovations to all of our campuses. Here's our tax rate since 2006. Our tax rate has decreased since 2006. And I then explain that if you've seen your taxes increasing, it's because the value of your property has increased, not because, not because CISD has increased our tax rates. As a matter of fact, if you look at that end of that chart, that's a huge, that's a huge fast dip. Mm -hmm. And so our, our tax rates have actually decreased significantly. And if you want to get these renovations done, if you want the things that you say you need on your campuses done, the only way that we're going to get those is if our um, staff in our community vote um, and allow us to make that happen. Because we want that and we need that for our children. So that's the end. I'll be glad to answer any questions that you have. Dr. Frost, why don't you just build a whole new high school? If you, if you have to do all that to that school, why don't, why don't you just build a whole new high school? I would love to do that. You would? Yes. Do you know how much a new high school I would have, cost? Um, $50 million. More than that. Really? About $118 million. Well, $118 That's in the Wagsahatchee Bond. Yeah, That's what they were... Yeah they were planning for their new high school. So could you even qualify for that much? We cannot. Mm -hmm. Of course, Ken ISD cannot get, we don't have the, the funding. A lot of the funding in um, bonds movement is based on the value of the homes in your district. It's based on the businesses in your district. And it's a lot of it has to do with your growth. And while we do get new students every year and we're a growing district, we are not a fast growth district like Waxahachie. So we could not qualify for $118 million bond. So building a new high school is not an option that we have. Thank you. Any other questions? I just like the fact that, you know, she's, you know, she's doing the presentation and she's putting it out there so everybody will understand, you know, because back in the day they didn't do that, you know, they just did stuff, you know, and so I just like the fact that she's educating the community, educating our staff, and that way, you know, if you have some questions you can ask her, she can tell you, but it's out there, you know, so 
Nobody has no excuse not to know what's going on. I'm looking at the camera. Okay. <laughs> well, and going back to building a new high school, even if we built, even if we were able to build a high school. Thank you. Uh, we still have to fix that facility. Yeah. The high school has yeah. to be fixed. The plumbing has to be fixed because we have to utilize that facility regardless. Mm -hmm. We can't walk, can't walk away, away like they walked away from Kmart mm -hmm. and let that building rot. Yeah. We have to utilize it and we have to get it fixed regardless. So I mean that that's what that's what we have to do and give our kids a facility that inspires them to want to be there and to learn. I mean they deserve that. So yeah. Well I just want to say thank you, Doctor Frost, for yeah. putting this together. Um you know, we, we asked asked you to, to come up, put up put something together, and you know you, you've done a great job. Thank you. And uh, I think we learned a lot from Raise Your Hand Texas. You know, I think this. You know, we can't thank them enough either. So thank you very much. Is there any is there any more discussion? Then we'll move in into the consent agenda. I move we approve the consent agenda as presented. Second. We get a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. Ayes have it. We've approved the consent agenda. Ms. Harrison, is there? Thank you. All right, everyone. We are going to adjourn into closed session as permitted by Texas Government Code Section 551.01.